just wanted to quickly welcome you all. Thank you for coming to Hypertherm. Thank you for touring our rain gardens and our buildings and hearing about some of the features that we've put into place here. In large part, we, as you heard, to handle uh, water surge here, and we saw those features. Um, we at Hypertherm have it in our mission statement to enrich our communities and environment. That is equal as a triple bottom line mission along with creating so industrial solutions for our customers around the world along with developing our associates. So the fact that that triple bottom line mission is there guides our work every day. Uh, we believe the UN when they say that humans are behind climate change. We also believe that industry is 21% of those greenhouse gas emissions, and we know we are a part of that 21%, and we take our responsibility to reduce our role in that 21% very seriously. We have a goal here that we set in 2010 for 2020 to reduce our carbon intensity by 50%, so to have that intensity, and we've already exceeded that goal, which is tremendous. Um, we're proud of that's on our sales. So we have made a huge set of efficiency gains. We have uh, purchased into the renewable energy market. Uh, we have incentivized commuting. We have incentivized different travel um, options for our company. And we know we have a long way still to go. So we learn a lot from you in these forums as well. They do inform our actions as a company. Um, so we're really grateful that you're all here, paying attention to this important issue. We are paying attention to as well. We want to be a partner in this path. So I'm really excited for um, for Alex and Sherry and Paige and the whole work group to put this uh, forum together. So thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Okay, so um, we're going to go ahead and dive into the first presenter, being Eric Osterberg. And um, Eric, again, as I mentioned, is an associate professor at Dartmouth College of Earth Sciences. And Eric's going to give us some background around what we're seeing in terms of the climate science. Thanks, Eric. Great. Thank you, Alex. And uh, really excited to see the turnout here tonight. Thank you all for, for coming out. Uh, what I'd like to do is give you an overview of what the science tells us about how climate change is affecting our area right here in the Upper Valley, particularly as in, in respect to the hydroclimate, downpours and droughts. And this is just an image of uh, one of the more extreme examples that we've seen around here recently. This is from uh, Hurricane Irene. So, uh, of course, the background of this whole story is, is encapsulated in this graphic, which is just showing the global average temperature over the last 130 years or so. And hopefully you guys have all seen this before. We know that it's getting warmer. It's warmed by about 2 degrees Fahrenheit globally since 1900. And the, the question is, you know, what is this doing to uh, our climate right here in the Upper Valley, and specifically to downpours and droughts? Just to make it very clear, there is no scientific debate that from 1970 on, all of this warming that we've seen is from human activity. And most of that is from greenhouse gases like CO2. There's no scientific debate about that. All right, so the question is, how has this affected uh, downpours and droughts in the Upper Valley? And I don't want to, this is going to be a mystery here. I want to tell you my take-home messages, and I'll try to convince you of them, and then we'll recap at the end. So I've done a lot of research in my own research group about downpours here in the Upper Valley. And what we found is that in 1996, uh, extreme rainfall, so extreme storms, which are storms that produce two inches of rain, or more in a single day, so two inches or more in a day, have jumped 50% beginning in 1996. And I'll show you what that looks like. And the bottom line is that we've been able to determine that the cause of that jump is not just from any one thing or any one season, but that it's from a combination of hurricanes, nor'easters, and thunderstorms over mostly the, the summer and fall seasons. In terms of drought, we usually uh, spend a lot of time in these forums talking about the, the first point here, the downpours. We, we spend a little less time talking about drought, and we want to spend more time talking about drought today. This is something that is often overlooked in this area because we're a pretty wet region. So one take home here is that drought is a lot more frequent in New Hampshire and Vermont than you may think, and that these, these droughts have real impacts, and we'll talk about some recent examples. And then as we look to the future, it is pretty clear that we should continue to expect more downpours 
at least like we've seen since 96, if not even more extreme than what we've seen recently. In terms of drought, there's a little bit of uncertainty. We may expect to see more summertime drought. It really depends on exactly what happens with total rainfall and when that rainfall happens. So I'll talk about more details there. So let's jump into the downpour side of things. Again, this is, um, this is research that I have been working on at Dartmouth with my colleagues, Wang Ping Wang, who's a graduate student, and Jonathan Winters, the geography department. And we started looking at this over the past three or four years. And what we've done is looked just at um, what has actually already happened. So this part of the talk is not dealing with computer models of the future. We're just talking about what we have already seen happening. So the way we do that is look at weather station records, and each little colored dot here represents a different weather station. Don't worry about the colors for now. All I'm trying to show you here is that we have a pretty good coverage over the greater northeast region, pretty uniform coverage from the coast to the interior. What we did is we only took the very best weather stations, the ones that were at least 95% complete. If it has a lot of holes in the data, we're not interested in that station. And we wanted to go back as far as we could, and the best data goes back to around 1900. And our particular interest was on extreme rainfall. And so what did we find? I mentioned in the beginning here that we saw a jump of around 50% in extreme rainfall in 1996. And this is what that looks like. What we've done is taken all the rain that falls in those stations in just the extreme events, the two inches or more. And we looked at that through time. So here's 1900, 120 years ago-ish, moving forward to present. And we can see that essentially there was no trend from the beginning of the 20th century up to 96. If we had just stopped this data in 1996, we would see no long-term trends. Lots of ups and downs, but no long-term trend. And then in 1996, something happened. We jumped to a new state. You can think of it as our new normal. And that new normal was 50% higher, 50% more extreme rainfall than we used to see. Real big question is, how is this going to continue into the future? Most of the evidence suggests that we should continue to see at least this level, if not higher levels, going into the future. So when you see something like this, the next obvious question is, what the heck happened in 1996? Right? What's going on here? What kinds of storms are causing this jump? And we can think about the kinds of things that cause extreme rainfall in the Northeast. Things like Hurricane Irene. These are tropical cyclones that start down in the Caribbean but make their way up to us sometimes. We can think about extreme thunderstorms in the summertime. We've seen some examples of this just in the past couple of summers. July 1st seems to be a particularly violent time in this area. 2013 and uh, in 2017, we had July 1st extreme thunderstorms cause a lot of damage around here. Or we can think about nor'easters. Nor'easters happen in the spring, summer, or fall, sometimes in the winter as well that we get you know, extreme rainfall in those. So what we found is that this is how it breaks down across those different types of storms. About half of that jump that we saw in 96 can be attributed to hurricanes. Half the story is hurricanes. A quarter of the story is those summertime thunderstorms. And about 15% of the story is from nor'easters. It turns out that it breaks down kind of nicely by season as well. We know that the hurricane season is right now. Right? It goes from the summer into the fall. Almost all of this 48% was just in the months of September and October. Okay? So we're really seeing a jump in terms of fall hurricanes. The thunderstorms are mostly a summertime phenomenon, so about 25% is a summer uh, thunderstorm story. And then most of this increase that we saw in the nor'easters happened back in the spring, March in particular. So we see a big increase in extreme rainfall associated with March nor'easters. So this is how it all uh, breaks down. And what's interesting about this to me is that it's not just one thing, right? We're seeing all the different types of extreme storms that we tend to get here, they're all tending to change and get more extreme. And I think that's a little concerning and, and particularly fascinating as a scientist. What this leads to is more frequent floods. And so there's much less research on this because the data are a little more difficult, a little more noisy. But the data we have, what I'm showing here, all of the blue upward pointing triangles mean that you've seen more flooding in that location. So you can see a lot of blue upward pointing triangles here showing that in the last uh, decade or so, from 2001 to 2012, we saw more flooding in those areas than from 1977 to 1988. 
this is what we would expect with that increase in extreme rainfall I just talked about. So the point here is that you would expect that intuitively, and we have actually seen those changes. And in this region, those sorts of flood events are really the ones that cause significant damage and cost a lot of money. So if we look at the history of um, expensive disasters here in New Hampshire, this is a slide that comes from our UVA co-chair Sherry, you can see that we used to spend you know, in the sort of five to 10, sometimes even below $5 million, all the way up to that 1996 change. And then since then, we've seen a dramatic increase in the amount of money that we have to spend to recover from these flooding disasters. And you can look down this list, and so many of these are floods. Flood, 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 flood. Floods are really the major story here in terms of the, the kinds of impacts that we see from climate change. All right, so let's switch to drought. We don't have to go very far back in time to have some experience with drought in this region. This is just earlier this summer, July 17, 2018. And what I'm gonna show is a few of these kind of plots. These are plots that are put out by the Drought Monitor. This is out of the University of Nebraska, and it's sponsored by a lot of different federal agencies. And what they do is classify drought according to different levels, different levels of extremeness, right? So yellow is a normally dry, moderate drought, severe, extreme, and then exceptional drought. So we can see that just earlier this summer in July, good portions of New Hampshire and Vermont were in moderate drought, and the rest was abnormally dry. If we fast forward, well, and these are the kinds of uh, headlines we saw, this is from NHPR. So New Hampshire drought spreads, officials seek to limit water use. That was from July 12th. As we fast forward to this week, this is the latest one of these, we can see that New Hampshire has um, sort of recovered from that. We're now no longer in any sort of drought. We had a very wet fall so far, particularly August and September, were extremely wet in New Hampshire. It was not particularly wet, however, in northern Vermont. In northern Vermont's drought has actually intensified a little bit. So one of the things that this shows us is that the entire region doesn't act the same. You can get extreme rainfall, particularly these kinds of downpours, can be highly localized. So we can get lots of rain coming through New Hampshire and into Maine, down in Massachusetts, but it might miss Vermont, or vice versa. Okay, the entire region doesn't act the same. And this is just from uh, last week. Drought continues to plague northern Vermont, leaving farms and wells dry. Perhaps the drought that is more prevalent in your memory, uh, sorry, this is just a, uh, of figures showing the location of wells that are right now today experiencing um, failure of some kind. Either they're low in water or they no longer have water in them. So this is a, uh, an updated figure that the Vermont um, Environmental Department puts out where people can put in their reports of having problems with their wells. So this is happening right now. The one that you probably remember more is the 2016 drought, which was just a couple summers ago. And this is what that map looked like then. You can see a lot more of these intense colors. So instead of just the moderate drought and abnormally dry, we were all the way up to the extreme drought level, particularly in southeastern New Hampshire and down into Massachusetts and coastal Maine. It wasn't quite as extreme up through Vermont, but they were also in uh, moderate drought conditions. And this got a lot more coverage. This had much bigger impacts. It's not a coincidence. The more extreme the drought, the bigger the impacts. So we had wells drying up across New Hampshire. We had, um, this is a picture of a reservoir down in Worcester, Massachusetts, which was extremely low. If we look at a map of the impacts in New Hampshire, this comes from the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. All of these little black and blue dots here show the location of communities that impose some sort of water restriction or ban in order to deal with the drought. So we had 166 communities that imposed some sort of restriction, primarily on outdoor water use, um, washing your car, you know, uh, watering your lawn, in particular, those sorts of things. We had 12 towns that had to set up emergency water sites, trying to get water to people whose wells had gone dry. And there was hundreds of people whose wells went dry. There was reports of 450 wells that were either replaced or deepened. So that gives you an indication of the magnitude that people with wells, particularly in the uh, Seacoast region, were uh, experiencing with this drought. And so, what do these droughts mean? You know, I mentioned the inherently dry all the way up to exceptional. 
This is what that means. The normally dry conditions occur somewhere in the state, <laughs> pick your state, New Hampshire or Vermont, occurs somewhere every six to nine months. Even moderate drought occurs somewhere every year within the state. <coughs> Once you get to the severe drought, we're talking about every three years somewhere in the state. Extreme drought, more like a decadal event every 10 years. And the exceptional is a truly exceptional event every 50 to 100 years. So when I was first looking at this, again, I'm a downpours guy. So when I was starting to look at this for this talk, this surprised me. Right, just how frequent we do see these drought kind of conditions here in New Hampshire. And this is what that looks like. So here's the history just over the last 18 years in New Hampshire and Vermont. Same color schemes we saw on the maps. The y-axis here is what percent of each state is experiencing those conditions. So we can see the 2016 drought here. And we can see lots of yellow here. Again, almost every year, on average, we're going to see abnormally dry conditions somewhere. The last major event that was similar to 2016 was back in 2002. Again, that's sort of a once every decade type event. And we can take this back even further. Each of these are just the same sort of plot starting in 2010 going back to 1950. Again, we can see lots and lots of drought happening here. In particular, the one that should jump out at you is this drought that occurred from 1963 to 1966 with a peak in 1965. This is the drought of record around here. This drought may have been so unusual, it's debated in the literature, but we may not have seen anything like this for a couple hundred years. Okay, but that was a big one. And that's what this one in 1965 looked like on these kinds of maps, okay? It was not just New Hampshire, Vermont, it was the entire Northeast region. Lots of impacts, particularly on agriculture. So one thing I think that's useful in this conversation is thinking a little bit about where our water goes, right? The water that we need. What is it used for? This may surprise people, but half of our water goes to electricity generation, okay, primarily cooling in, um, in electricity generation plants. This is specifically for New Hampshire. About 20% goes to municipal water supplies, 10% industrial like we have here, 9% is to people um, you know, getting water from their own wells, so that's their sort of own personal use just like this, only it's wells versus city and then agriculture, irrigation, and mining. In terms of how you use water in your own home, the averages look like this. So about 30% from the faucet, from bathing, and from clothes washing, and then 25% from toilet. So these are fairly evenly distributed, and if you're thinking about how to deal with a water shortage or a drought in your own home, if you're particularly on well water, these are the things to really focus on, right? If you can even pick just one or two of these, you can have a big impact on reducing your water consumption. All right, so let's look quickly at the future and then I'll take questions. When we look at the future, we use our climate models. And so when the climate models look to the future for rainfall, this is specifically for the Northeast region. It comes from my colleagues at the University of New Hampshire. And these are hot off the press. You just, we just looked at these for the first time a couple of days ago, okay? And so what we see is that heading into the future, we do expect the Northeast to continue to get wetter. We've seen that over the last century. We expect that to continue into the future. We also expect to see more downpours in the future. What's interesting to me, though, is that these models can't quite capture the thing that's been causing the increase in downpours we've already seen. The increase in hurricanes, we're pretty convinced, is because of warmer ocean temperatures down here in the Caribbean, which puts more water vapor in the atmosphere. And water vapor is like gasoline for a hurricane. It's not a coincidence that Hurricane Florence, Hurricane Harvey have been dumping so much rain. They've got tons of extra water vapor that they didn't used to have because the oceans are warmer. So it's not actually that we see more hurricanes come up here. It's that the ones that come up here have been fed with more water vapor down here, and so they can dump more rain on top of us. And the other thing that the models can't quite capture is that the increase in thunderstorms we see is because we've seen a change in the jet stream. It's gotten more wavy. It looks more orange like this, and it used to look more red. The waves used to be smaller. So we're pretty sure that that's what's enhancing our thunderstorms in the summer, but we know that our climate models don't capture that yet. So even though the models say it's supposed to get wetter, I'm concerned that we may see even a, a larger increase in the rainfall because they can't even quite capture this yet. The technology isn't quite there. In terms of, um, specifically in the summer when we worry about drought, it's interesting that the models actually show no change. 
So most of the change in um, precept in that last model figure I showed is in the other seasons. And so if this is correct, then this is a real concern to us. Because if rainfall ends up in the summertime staying flat, we know that temperatures are going up dramatically, 5 to 12 degrees Fahrenheit. And what that means is that you're evaporating more water out of the soil, right? And that's what's going to enhance your drought conditions. If water ends up staying the same, temperatures go up, we will see more summertime drought. The wild card is if we continue to see the summers get wetter and wetter and wetter. And so that's why I have some uncertainty about exactly what drought is going to do in the future. But it's quite clear to me that we need to be prepared. Right? It doesn't make any sense for us just to put our head in the sand. We know temperatures are going up. And even if it gets a little bit wetter with this amount of temperature rise, we would still expect to see more summer drought. So possibility of more summer drought. All right, that's back to my take home messages. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. not done a overall analysis of the winds, what I would say, we looked at winds with hurricanes. We don't see that the hurricanes have stronger winds. We do see that they're moving slower. So not the winds are moving slower, but the storm itself are moving slower. And that goes back to that wavy jet stream I was talking about. So we've seen this with Harvey, we've seen this with Florence. Why did they dump so much rain? They just stalled, they sat there. And so we don't see that quite same extreme here in the Northeast. They don't just sit and stall, but they are moving over our region more slowly. In terms of the events that you're talking about, mostly the thunderstorms, with the wavier jet stream and this warming that we're seeing, we would expect to see more intense thunderstorms, and it's that um, the intensity of the thunderstorm is what's going to drive the winds. And so it's really hard to get good data on like those peak winds during thunderstorms, but I'll bet you that with the increase in thunderstorm rain, we probably have seen an increase in some of the thunderstorm winds as well. That would be my guess, but we haven't done the analysis, so I can't say for sure. Considering that the one season you didn't talk about was the winter, mm. and the four months or more of the winter that we have here, um, it, in the 24 years that I've lived around here, it seems that we're getting less snowfall, less big storms with multiple inches of snow, and what impact does that have on both drought and uh, water flow conditions in streams and the meltdown in the spring? Can you yeah, comment about the winter? question. <laughs> so we have seen a decrease in, um, certainly in snow cover. Snowfall is very tricky to measure because we have to measure in terms of the amount of water that's in the snow. Like when we measure snow, we just measure how much snow is there. Right. But to do it 
properly as a scientist, you'd have to get how much water is there. And there's very few places that do that. Um, but we have definitely seen a decrease in the snow and the fire, and that has a huge impact on the conditions that you get the following spring and summer in terms of flooding and drought. So one of the key reasons that we had that drought in 2016 in the summer is because that winter of 15-16, you guys remember that winter? Yeah. Nothing happened that winter. We didn't have a winter in 2015-16. We had a huge El Nino, one of the biggest ever. It was very warm. We had very little snow. My kids were Nordic skiing at the Ford Sayer program here. They did dry land the entire season. There was no snow to ski on Nordic wise. And the downhill team wasn't even really skiing until mid-January. So there was very little snow. That meant that there was um, less uh, of that snow melt to keep the soil moist the following summer. And that made it that much easier to drive out with the warm temperatures in the, in the summer of 16. So yes, yeah, snowfall very intimately linked with drought, and we do expect to see continuing decreases in snow cover, which again would tend to enhance this sort of short-term summertime drought in the future. Impact on invasive species? Impact on invasive species. Good question, Dennis. Um, I don't feel like I can answer that with any sort of authority. Um, my Guess would be that as we change the hydroclimate, we're going to see a shift in the vegetation that is best adapted to those conditions. But I don't have the data or expertise to really comment intelligently on that. Maybe somebody else here does. As an energy committee person, I'd like to share this information with my home. Uh, community, and I'm wondering, is this on your website anywhere? These slides. So we will make this presentation and all other presentation, and in fact, every presentation that's in any of our forums, going back six years, are all available on our webpage. And there will be a follow-up email that will direct you to that webpage. Great. I'm wondering about is anybody tracking the correlation to forest fire events? Such as there are out west against ground. Yes. Yeah. So there was a slide that I had to pull for time. So during the um, 2016 event, we did see an increase in wildfires. You know, wildfires are not as huge of an issue here as they are, say, out west. But we do see an increase with the drier conditions with with wildfire activity in, in, in New Hampshire, at least. Do you anticipate the additional wetness uh, to be deleterious to the health? That's a great question. So clearly the flooding events themselves are deleterious to agriculture. Um, you may actually see a, a boost to some agriculture with this increased precipitation, but I suspect that that would be more than offset by the increased temperature heat stress in the summertime. Um, in terms of the forest, you know, I live kind of on a swamp. <laughs> We've got a lot of beautiful swamp land in my house. And uh, we've seen, just since we've been there with this increased extreme rainfall, we've seen you know, a lot of these big trees that have grown up in the swamp in drier conditions, their, their root systems are saturated and they're just coming over. They're sort of dying and just falling over um, much more easily than they used to on our property. You can see these trees have been there a long time and just flopping over. So, you know, that may be a bit of an extreme example because we're in sort of a wetland, um, very close to my house, but that's something to consider, right? These changes in moisture, again, these different kinds of vegetation are suited to these different conditions. Maybe one more, and then we should. Yes. So, uh, town planners, when they're looking at the projects, thinking about uh, stormwater management and 50 year storm to be time for a 100 year storm and so on. Is there any economic analysis that would suggest what the payoffs are for building for only 50 year storms or building for 100 year storms? So, yes, there is. And um, actually, I'll let Sherry tackle that. There's a statistic you have about the amount of money you put in to, to plan for these sort of flood events and the amount of money you save. If you want to just talk about that real quick. 
Sure, Eric, thank you. Yep, there's some research done by the Multi-Hazard Mitigation Council that tells us just for flooding alone, if we start to prepare now, for every $1 we invest now, will save us $4 in repairs and recovery. But there's new data out just in 2016, I believe, that is also from that same Multi-Hazard Mitigation Council that says if we prepare for not just flooding, but also wildfires, hurricanes, and these other incidents, we can save $6 for every one dollar invested. So it makes sense to start to think about this, and this is what we're gonna get into with um, Kevin and Megan when we start to talk about what you as homeowners can do and what you can do in your communities to think about these things and start to make wise investments. Thank you for that question. Yeah, and the last thing I'll say before we move on is just, you know, those those 50-year floods and 100-year floods, those are all based on outdated data now. Those are all based on this data. So our 50-year floods from back here may now be our 20-year floods in our new regime. Our 100-year floods may now be our 50-year floods, right? So we actually, all those sort of tables that we have, FEMA is in the process of slowly trying to update them for this new normal regime that, that we've experienced since 96. All right, thanks very much, folks. So thank you again, Eric. Thank you very much. If there are additional questions, we will have additional time in the community dialogue. And uh, so if you save your question, Eric will be here and we will uh, be able to continue the conversation. Okay, well, as Sherry is pulling up the slides, uh, Sherry is going to make a presentation here and facilitate a conversation with some of our local planners, as I mentioned, Kevin and Megan. So I'm going to go ahead and hand the uh, baton here to Sherry. And uh, Kevin and Megan, you guys are on deck. Thanks for coming on up. Great, thank you. Kevin and Megan, come on down. All right, these guys are our experts here, and so we wanted to set up like a little mini panel, ask them some questions, and you guys can chime right in as we're asking these guys questions about what they experience in their days to day. But before we get going, I wanted to add a couple of things. Eric and I compared slides before we started, so I will not repeat his slides. But I just wanted to set you guys up, and there's some fun things to think about. There's that July 17 slide. Eric showed something similar to that from the drought monitor. So there's New Hampshire, mid-July. Pretty much everybody's either abnormally dry or in moderate drought. And then in Concord, we experienced the most precipitation we have ever had on record in August. We got about 10.6 inches, when usually we get about four. So right at the end of one month into the next, we had this extreme change. But if you look at the end of the month for New Hampshire, again, that same drought monitor, there were portions of the state around Winnipesaukee and going up north that were still abnormally dry, although Concord was swimming. So as Eric mentioned this, it can be very localized, it can be very extreme, and it can be very variable. So I wanted to point that out because I thought that was really interesting. And then this is another great slide. I love the Drop Monitor. It's one of my favorite nerdy websites. So if you're bored, go to the Drop Monitor. So this is in September 2017. And you can see everybody was doing well. We weren't really in much of normally dry, a little bit in the coast. And now you notice all these maps are printed on the last Thursday of the month. And that's consistent on the Drop Monitor. So now you jump ahead a month, and here we are, October 24th, and both New Hampshire and Vermont are abnormally dry or moderate drought. 51% abnormally dry, 12% in moderate drought. This is October 24th, okay? The, the release was on October 26th. If you remember 2017, what happened on the 29th? We had one of the biggest rainstorms. Remember the gusts, the trees were down? We were flooded, I was flooded pretty bad in New Hampshire. And this was the fourth largest storm-related power outage in New Hampshire history. We were just in drought four days ago. Okay, so downpours and droughts, they can happen right next to each other. And when the soil is really dry, um, dried out from that period of drought, when the rain hits, it runs right up, just like cats pile of flour, right? You saw that in the back. Okay, so this just happened last year. So when we think about water, and Eric showed us some of the uses that we have in our homes about water, but most people immediately think about their drinking water, because water is life, right? And so when we think about sources of drinking water, 
there's two ways we get our water. Water, one is groundwater, and people, some people still have shallow wells, some have deep wells, and then surface water. Municipal systems often will have a surface water um, source, rivers, lakes, and reservoirs. How many people in this room have their own private well? Show of hands. Thank you very much, because, oops, too fast. Private well owners in Vermont make up 70% of the population. In New Hampshire, it's 46%. So when we start thinking about what we can personally do, this is what drives us home, because we start to say, ooh, I, I hope my well is deep enough. All right, so tonight, we're going to talk about how when you manage for these flooding events, you can sometimes help yourself in time of drought. So we're thinking about slowing the flow, spreading the water, and absorbing and infiltrating it. And so we're going to have Kevin and Megan talk a little bit with us about the things they experience in their communities. And I'm going to prompt them with some questions, just because I thought that would be fun. <laughs> so Kevin and Megan, how are the communities you work with preparing for flooding episodes? A couple of quick examples. OK, uh, so in Vermont, there are two main things. There's the getting ready for it and the recovering from it, and not having it hit you in the first place. So not having it hit you would be floodplain regulations, don't build where it's going to flood. Getting ready for it, doing planning around disaster planning, and then recovery planning, what are you going to do afterwards, and how does your community kind of hold together and make sure that, that, they, uh, that they respond effectively. Sure, and uh, we second that in New Hampshire. Um, we also do a lot of work with our hazard mitigation plans with our local municipalities, and pieces of those plans are really important because they come from the, the local municipality. They're not just state, fee, state data, data or FEMA data where the floodplains are. You know where those roads flood that are not on a map somewhere, and then we can help track that, and um, historical um, tracking that data is really helpful. And when you put this information in your hazard mitigation plan, does that help you if you do get hit by a flood to be able to use FEMA dollars to recover, to rebuild that culvert or rebuild that bridge? You got it. Uh, FEMA actually requires you to have an updated hazard mitigation plan every five years in order to qualify for FEMA funding. Um, so if your county is designated as a FEMA uh, disaster area, even if nothing happened in your municipality, you are still eligible for that funding if your hazard mitigation plan is up to date. How many people in this room have seen flooding in their community? <laughs> that's, that's my audience participation. <laughs> How many people in this room have seen their hazard mitigation plan? That was going to be my next question. <laughs> their hazard mitigation plan. Okay, good. Y'all probably have. And you can get involved in adding information into that. The hazard mitigation plan has traditionally been done by your emergency management director, but we're trying to get communities to have more involvement around those because if it floods at your house, your emergency management director might not know it unless you share that information. So we want to use hazard mitigation planning as much as we can because as Megan and Kevin both can attest to, that allows you to get the money you need from the federal government. That bar chart that Eric put up there about how the federal government gives us money to recover, then if it's in your plan, you can use that money for those damages. <coughs> Good. Any other comments about flooding? Any fun facts? What do you say about Waterbury? Uh, oh, I kind of do my Jeff Foxworth routine, which says, you know, if you live in a town that has the words water and berry in it together, you're probably going to have flooding. <laughs> if you live on Water Street next to Great Roaring Brook, <laughs> call me. Yeah. Call Kevin. Okay. All right. Great, thank you guys. And do the communities you work with have plans or preparedness for drought? Not so much. Uh, and I think drought is an understated risk. I do a lot of risk talking. And so uh, Eric saw, you saw Eric's stuff over there. And that, that kind of bottom drought, that dark brown drought, that's a 50 to 100 year event. These storms are 50 to 100 year events too. Although, as Eric said, maybe they're not anymore, maybe they're a little more uh, frequent. But still, a 50 to 100 year event is not an extreme event, if you think about it. It's a, it's a relatively good sized risk for you to be running out of water. And uh, I would say when communities start planning and they say, oh yeah, let's build those subdivisions out there, whatever, they're not thinking, and we'll rethink all that in 20 years when we get the new numbers on water, right? 
those houses are built, those factories are built. All those things assume that the water will be on there as far as you can draw a chart. Um, and, and we need to be thinking about that in those half years as things get higher. So bringing up those hazard mitigation plans again, uh, they, droughts are also a natural hazard, so they go in there. Uh, so out of 18 municipalities that I've worked with recently updating their hazard mitigation plans, 16 out of those 18 uh, said that drought was a low or low medium risk. Even though we have droughts in the past <coughs> five years, have quite a few. Um, so towns, I, will, we, I work primarily with municipalities. And all of you who raised your hand that have private wells, what is your municipality going to do for you in a drought? What can they do? Right? Their concern right now is on public water supplies. So their, their plans, if they have them, are about restrictions, water use, water ordinances, drought management plans. Guess how many there are? Not very many. They're in master plans of something to be done, but from my experience, not many of them have been completed because drought's not really a thing here. It's just a low risk. That's kind of what I'm seeing anyway. Yeah. So can we all agree that it's important to change that perception and help people understand that drought may not be as low of a risk as it used to be when we were looking at that old time frame that Eric showed us in his data? Yeah. Heads are bobbing. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I, I use uh, fires a lot, structural fires, because we all have fire departments in our town. Fires are an extremely low risk for your house. You know, you may get one house burning down in your town every year, but it's a very, very low risk. We all wear seatbelts tonight because we're afraid of crashes. Ex infinitesimal low risk. And so we behave in certain ways to deal with risks that are way, way smaller than those drought risks are. Good point, thank you. So while we're on the topic of municipal responsibility, we heard tonight here that a large part of the population in both Vermont and New Hampshire relies on private wells. So what happens if a private well goes dry? Like our office did. <laughs> uh, you get a porta potty, you put it outside. It's kind of inconvenient for a while. You drill a deeper well, which is what we did eventually, um, and you get more water. Uh, hopefully, the well hits what it needs to hit. Uh, but it's not cheap out there. Uh, however, there's some things, of course, you can do getting into that so you're not pulling as much water out of the ground in terms of conservation. I guess the bottom line here is that you're on your own. The cost comes to the private well owner. Uh, it's not gonna be on the municipality or the state if you're a private well owner, or though, although there are some sources out there that can help. Um, and if, again, if it's a bigger, bigger event where most of your town or city is impacted, there should be some things in place where there would be a, a place where you can get water located within your city or town. Um, and that's kind of what we're, what we're trying to tease out here, see if we know if these things exist, and, and if, they, if they do, that you know about it. I did a little research in preparing for tonight. I'm familiar with New Hampshire because I am engaged with the people in my agency, but Vermont and New Hampshire both have a Vermont management team, a Vermont, wait, excuse me, a drought management team or task force. And on each of those teams and task force within both states, the state climatologist is a part of that team. And these teams mobilize when we started to get into those moderately dry conditions or when we're looking like we might get into some sort of drought and they have multi-agencies at the table so they can talk together, they can look at stream gauge data, they can talk about how they need to let their municipal systems, the municipal water systems, understand what these impacts might look like, get the information out to the private well owners so we can all start to conserve. During 2016, what I did is I put a bucket in my shower and every time I started my shower, instead of letting the water go down the drain until it got warm, I would catch it in a bucket and then I'd water my plants or my dogs, whoever needed it, and it was a great way for me to just make sure my well wasn't gonna go dry. I still have that bucket in my shower. I just changed my behavior. Why not? The dogs need to drink, right? It's clean water. So there's just these little things we can think of ourselves, but I want you all to know that there are drought management task force in your state, whether you're from Vermont or New Hampshire, 
who are thinking about this issue. It's not low risk in our priority systems when you're in a state agency and you've seen what has happened in the past few years. So I just want you to have a little bit of, ooh, okay, someone's thinking about this. <laughs> but you are on your own if your well goes dry, and it, and it can be expensive to, to refract that well or to draw, drill deeper. And I got a lot of calls during 2016 about, did I have any funding sources to help people pay for their wells to get drilled deeper? And we must remember that a, a well driller only drills till they get water. They don't keep going. So if the drought in one year gets worse two years later, and you just spent, I don't know how much, on getting your well drilled deeper, it might not be still functional if that drought persists. So it's, I'm not trying to scare you, I'm just trying to say think about these things. Because it's easy to do things in our own homes, especially to conserve water. Do you guys have any examples for, from your communities that have experienced drought besides your office? <laughs> Well, um, most of our, our municipalities luckily haven't experienced anything too drastic that I know of that's been reported, at least on paper. Uh, but many of the municipalities have reported private wells running dry. And again, it, it's not their issue. And the few people that show up at these meetings, that's what they're thinking. Um, so, but they, the towns do tend to do public outreach during those times. And hopefully people are checking the websites and looking at the town flyers. But I think, I think you have some better examples. Actually, that's very much where we are too. Uh, the municipalities haven't gone dry. Well, lots of private wells went dry both in the early 2000s and in, in this one. And I had people call me up saying, you know, what's the governor going to do about it? And I'm saying, the governor's not going to do very well. Uh, for some reason, you got to go call the well driller. Well. And you say that with a nice voice. I do. I say, if a thousand of you call me, um, then maybe the governor, because we have a way of, you know, if your house floods, that's not a disaster. A thousand house floods, it's a disaster. And so sometimes personal pain can become public pain once there's enough out there. That's, that's the way disasters work. I don't know why. But. Yeah. Okay. Great. And what, that, what do you guys think that we could do both at the home level and town level to start to think about these things? I gave you my example of putting a bucket in the shower. Yeah. Pretty high tech, I know. Well, the, the, the five gallon bucket is your best disaster friend. So everybody get a five gallon bucket. Keep all your disaster supplies in it. You use it to get your water. Many, many things you can do with a five gallon bucket. So yeah, I, what I do is I just put them under my eaves. I have a couple spots the water goes. I don't do it just when it's dry. I just do it all summer. That's what I use to water the flower bed and stuff. It's just one less bit of water. You've got to go get somewhere else. And in fact, it's easier for me because then I don't have to go over and turn the faucet on, get the hose, whatever. I just go get the bucket and start doing it. So um, any little thing like that, you don't need to do fancy rain gardens and barrels and all that type of thing, although it looks great. Just a five gallon bucket under the heat. On the municipal level, I think there are a few things that we could do. Um, one thing is to hold your municipality accountable, accountable for what's in your master plan through supporting through these different plans and projects that they're working on, um, including drought management plans if, they, if that's something that they have. Um, another thing that we all, are all probably thinking about, like, this is great, but how do we find funding? We've talked about funding already, FEMA funding. Other things we, we can do to make ourselves eligible for funding are things like asset, stormwater asset inventories, culvert assessments. Um, I know this is a plug for the RPCs a little bit, and we, we are there for you, for technical assistance, um, to, to do a lot of these projects. One of the projects I do is an intense culvert assessment for aquatic organism passage geomorphic compatibility, hydraulic capacity, damage and sediment buildup of all culverts. Um, having this sort of data can help back you up in the event that there is a storm and you're looking for money to replace that culvert and they're gonna say, well, what did it look like before? Well, I don't know, it was like this big and it kind of was in great condition, but it wasn't. You know, there are things, having those historical records really, really help put you in a better place for grant funding for certain things like that. Um, yeah. 
Um, another thing you can do at, in Vermont, we do it at the state level somewhat, but your town could do it at below the state level right now. If you build an acre of impervious surface, uh, you get a stormwater permit in Vermont that's going to have an acre, but that's still a pretty good size chunk of impervious surface. But your town could enact regulations around that to basically keep that stormwater on site, as many of you saw around here. You have detention ponds out there, do a variety of things. That stormwater then infiltrates, which helps all the groundwater in your well keep going, and it doesn't run off into the ditch and hit the town road down there and cause you town problems. So uh, stormwater regulations at the local level are a great thing to do. Awesome. Now, Kevin and Lace, do you think there's anything I've missed that you'd like to share with your knowledge to this group of people? Jen, what's the mantra? Uh, so let's pretty secret. I know about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, Alex set up the slow spread and sink it up there, uh, which is both good for floods because you're keeping, you're kind of cutting off the peak of the hydrograph so that water is hitting the river at different times, and you're also increasing your groundwater infiltration, so you're helping the drought. So you, you can do stuff that helps droughts and floods at the same time. And that was the point of tonight's event. So thank you for bringing that message home. Do you have something yeah. else? Yeah, I just would like to reiterate, please get involved in your local planning and local government of things like this. All these meetings are open to the public. And without your help and your knowledge from coming to something like this, the right people may not be at the table. And this is what we see often, especially in the smaller towns. So please, 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 please get involved. And you know, before you clap for them, I have one more thing to say, because it's about you. And you all come away from here with a little more education. You come away from these forums a little more informed. And I'm asking you to take that information and to share it. Bring it up at the Thanksgiving dinner table. I think it would be a great idea to bring your family together, better than talking about politics. <laughs> you can talk about these things to people to help them understand, to help them connect the dots. Because I think we all live in our little world where we're not thinking about these things we see in our weather patterns around us and how they actually are indicators of a changing climate. And if you can help people connect those dots, you can help people begin to act more. And that's really what this is about. It's about being proactive so that we're not as impacted when we experience these extreme weather events. So now you can clap for our speaker. <laughs> One more thing, uh, for those of you who aren't already on your conservation commission or your planning commission or something, uh, those people spend a lot of hours at night with people like Megan and I uh, drafting plans and regulations that then go to the select board for votes. And oftentimes there's about two people who show up for that meeting. And if the two people don't like it, our work goes down the drain sometimes. If the two people like it, we get to keep going forward. So you don't necessarily need to spend the countless hours, but if you can show up for those hearings and say, you know, this little part here on stormwater or drought is a good thing, keep doing that. That can make a critical difference in making our work actually have legs. And we want their work to have legs because they're very, very well versed in their field. Thank you guys so much. All right. Questions for our distinguished panel? Or just us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what distinguished panel? <laughs> Is there a risk of increased storm water runoff impacting our municipal wastewater treatment system? Um, yeah, you mean there's the actual flood getting into your wastewater treatment system, yes. Um, uh, the Montpelier system was, was dicey during Irene. Uh, those systems are usually built down low because that's the way things flow. And um, they're, they're not protected against all events, they're just protected against big events. So that is an issue. Um, also, some of you live in communities with combined sewer overflows, and so when there's too much water going down those drains, which then goes into your wastewater system, they just kick the valve over and all of that just discharges. Um, that happens sometimes, not good. But also those floods, uh, what they do is they, they're not great for water quality to those extreme events because they mobilize a lot of stuff that should be sitting out in the field uh, and put it in the river. Question? Any others? Okay, thank you very Not that I know of in Vermont. No. 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 Not either. Right. 
I have a little anecdote. I have a little anecdote, just excuse me, Representative. So I live in a town, and they had this great idea to put in some municipal fields for our children to play soccer. And it was during the 2016 drought. And so, you know, I was concerned about my, my well, because, you know, I'm selfish. I want to have water at the house. And uh, so my municipality is watering these fields during the day, during the hot piece of the day. So I, I'm burning mad, right? Because I talk about drought all day, because this is my job. And I come home and my municipality's got their straw in the same groundwater that I'm putting a bucket under my shower for. So quite the opposite. I was the annoying municipal resident calling up saying, I don't think you need to be watering the field right now. If you're going to water the field, try to water them at night. I don't think the grass looks pretty green. So quite the opposite. There was a, a bunch of us yakety neighbors calling the municipality asking them not to water the fields during the drought. I took those drought signs and I hung them up all around there. I was like, I've got, I'm like, I've turned into one of these people. So it's quite the opposite might happen. Sorry, Representative. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, when this workshop started, it was after a couple of really bad floods. So um, and at that time, FEMA was not allowing people to build, cul to build culverts that were bigger and better than the ones that had been washed away by the floods. And we were all sure the floods were going to keep coming. Um, we're still pretty sure, I think. So has FEMA finally changed? Uh, in, in general, no. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a couple things on FEMA. As Eric said, our future floods probably aren't our floods of our past. All your flood maps are based upon the floods of the past. Uh, there is very little movement to update those maps. As far as the culverts go, typically what happens, uh, and many of you may have seen it, when you get a flood, the culvert itself doesn't fail. The road fails around the culvert. So there's a shiny culvert sitting in a great big hole. FEMA comes and they say, that culvert looked perfectly fine. You can't replace the culvert because the culvert wasn't damaged. Um, so that's a, a long conversation with FEMA. However, um, if the culvert is damaged, at least in Vermont, and, and they may have worked in New Hampshire, uh, what we've done in Vermont is towns adopt a road bridge standard now, pretty much. And that road bridge standard says that when FEMA's not in town, if it fails, the town will be building it back better. When FEMA comes, the same rule applies to FEMA. So it cuts both ways. Um, it'll be more expensive, but you'll get that bigger culvert, assuming the culvert itself actually is the end. From my experience, the biggest issue with culverts is maintenance. It's not undersizing. There are a few out there that are undersized, but a handful, but it's mostly maintenance, not really keeping track of what's happening to the stream. The stream has moved over time, the culvert's staying in the same place. The road's still there too, so now water's washing over the road instead of the culvert doing its job. That's just kind of what I'm seeing, but I think FEMA is sticking with the same thing. It's gonna replace exactly what was there before, um, you know, obviously with some new material. Um, <coughs> no, no. Okay. Vermont went through, post Irene, Vermont went through very strong debates with FEMA. And it took probably nine or ten months. But FEMA did change their position. Um, so FEMA will now <coughs> upgrade your culverts. And as Kevin says, if you have road and bridge standards that require you to upgrade those. So your local policy will influence whether or not FEMA will pay for that increased size of the culvert. And if you don't know how to create such a policy for your community, you can call Kevin. <coughs> or Meg, depending on which side of the river you exist. I have a problem with increasing the culverts because Uh, so that that comment was about if you increase the culvert size and you pass the water, somebody downstream gets the water, obviously. Um, and, and that is a concern. Right now, sometimes culverts 
uh, undersized culverts and the roads themselves act as like little mini storage ponds until they fail catastrophically and, and then it's worse. But, um, but that is an issue and so it's much better to keep the water on the site through proper stormwater management than to say, well, we'll just you know, plumb our way out. We uh, maybe time for one more question. Yep. Okay, maybe two. <laughs> uh, I have a situation where uh, I am uh, in a my house is in a uh, flood designated area by FEMA. Uh, it has never flooded, even during the 1973 500-year flood. It seems to be perfectly functioning the system. Flooding, I still get done for the insurance. Is there any way that I can appeal that and get out of that? Uh, are you in New Hampshire or not? <laughs> okay, uh, we should talk afterwards and we'll go with specifics of that. But yes, there's yes. a way. Yes, there's a way. <laughs> Something that I've been thinking about a lot lately is what would happen if a municipality, um, if the public water was completely cut off, if um, the service was interrupted, uh, what should residents do? What would residents do? And um, I don't really know of hazard mitigation plans that cover that type of thing. If, if you just, if your municipal water just goes, uh, is interrupted, if that service is interrupted. Uh, right, uh, so hazard mitigation plans are, are meant to lessen the effects of a hazard, um, but they're not really meant as response plans. And so that's a distinction in the emergency world. Uh, there are two things that could happen that could cause that. One is an extreme power outage, which shuts off all your municipal water supply and you know, your well pump and all those type of things. Just like having no water, the water supply just can't get it. Um, or some type of extended long period of drought where we just don't get the water. And the answer is you move to where there's water. And that's really the answer. Um, you know, you're going to be a couple days, things can, we can work things out, a couple weeks, systems all start shutting down, a couple months, you literally get up and move. Yeah, I, I see that. I mean, think about California, you know, not just getting up and moving, but they have had to find other water sources, it's more costly, it's more infrastructure cost. Um, in, the, in the smaller emergencies, uh, we, we would set up you know, a place in the center of town or somewhere emergency shelter. Every town has an emergency shelter, also a secondary shelter. Usually it's one of your schools, has backup generators, stuff like that. You can probably host, you know, water there. We'd be trucked in or something like that. Obviously it would be costly for the town, but there would be some sort of local emergency operations plan or something in place that should hopefully address that sort of issue. And one example I have from Summersworth, New Hampshire, there was a huge flood, a 2006 flood, and it wiped out the water system. And so they had a mutual aid agreement with a, a local sister municipality, Dover, and they could switch their water to get it from a different place. So some larger municipalities have those municipal um, agreements, mutual aid redundancy type systems. So it depends on what the issue is. So, but, yep, good question. All right, I think we're gonna wrap it up because we wanna keep going with our next speakers where you're gonna learn about things that you can do to take action. But you may be getting tired of sitting, so while we switch the slides, stand up and stretch. And if anybody has to use a restroom or coffee, please go ahead and do that now, but don't go far because we wanna keep you in the room. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so hopefully that was a good stretch break. And uh, it's an option to slow we get in here. So we, uh, we have, uh, a couple of more presentations, really, uh, I think, uh, valuable presentations that are going to help expand on the discussion we've had to date. And then we're also going to end again with our community dialogue. And so hearing more questions, answers, concerns, and <coughs> that you have in mind that we can all take. So I'm going to uh, hand over the mic here to Kat, Kat Buxton, um, soil educator and Compost. And the compost queen. <laughs> Don't get around. Thank you, Kat. All right. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope that you had a moment to check out this little activity with Dee Dee, her house over on the table here to the right. Dee Dee designed this um, because it works really well to give 
the whole overview of basically what I'm going to talk to you about is the structure of soil and how that can help us to better manage our water through times of flooding and in drought. This picture is of sixth graders. Uh, I, I cut their faces off because, you know, they're 12. Um, and it's sixth graders teaching other sixth graders how to do this exercise and what it means, how it relates to compost and climate change. So this is a pretty easy thing. Sixth graders are doing it. This is Thetford Elementary School uh, sixth graders teaching Rivendell sixth graders just two weeks ago. So um, I'm going to give a, just a little bit of an overview and then really get into solutions because I think that's what we all need. Um, I don't have all the solutions, I'll tell you that, but I do have some suggestions. So this is true. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, we have about 60 years of topsoil left. Um, and if we just think about the Midwest in a place where the buffalo left us 20 feet of topsoil, not all that long ago, we've got about three or four feet left in most places. The corn and soybean digest, which is, you know, agriculture, like industrial agriculture, they support all of this information as well. There's a statistic out there uh, that says that for every bushel of corn that is grown using industrial farming techniques, we lose a bushel of soil. And for every bushel of soy, we lose 1.2 bushels of soil. So this picture is Iowa corn in 2018, taken by my colleague Peter Donovan from the Soil Carbon Coalition. Um, and you're looking at basically flour underneath corn. We're back in Vermont now. Um, you know, are we any better at holding on to our soil than Iowa? I went to a a healthy soils meeting recently on the national scale and the woman from Iowa is this wonderful woman working for the Environmental Conservation District told me that Iowa is not proud that they contribute about 90% of the nitrous oxide or the nitrogen runoff that goes into the ocean um, dead zones. And that's because of that corn picture that I showed you and the bushel being lost. So um, we're not that much better, actually. We don't have 10,000 acres of corn, but we do have 90,000 acres of field corn in Vermont. Um, so, yep, Irene uh, left us with a lot of images of flooding, and this one on the bottom right is actually at Thetford Elementary School on July 1st, and those are our raised beds uh, that became islands temporarily, and it actually lifted, uprooted, and flipped our peach tree that was full of fruit but um, we, we did get fruit and we saved it. So, um, yep, there's Vermont soil heading right into Long Island Sound, along with it, anything that we add to our farm soil and to our yards and gardens and anything we left in our yards that we can um, pretty much end it up down there. And so 800 million in infrastructure damage, that does not account for a single grain of soil that was lost. And is soil worth money? So uh, what can we do to hold our landscapes in place and hold our water in place? And the two things are totally connected. I'm not gonna read you these things, but I'm gonna talk at you while you read those. <laughs> Um, on the right hand side, we're looking at a tiny pine sapling with mycorrhizal fungus. That's what we're looking at all there. That's not all roots. We're starting to learn that mycorrhiza actually do an amazing job of communicating among plants between trees. You may have heard the great talk that Trees, trees Talk BPR did recently. Look that up. Mycorrhizal fungus is extremely fragile. It can't really handle much shoveling. It certainly can't handle tillage. Mycorrhizal fungus is the primary function of nutrient cycling in the soil, along with bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods. This is called the soil food web, which was actually just discovered in 1990. So it's a pretty new thing, but it turns out that these billions and billions and billions and billions of microbes actually make the goos and goos and snots and slimes that hold our landscape together. So back to the soil and bread activity, the difference between the soil, or between the flour and bread, 
flower is a stand-in for sand, silt, and clay without any biology and no soil organic matter. And the bread, the only difference is that we add water and then we add yeast, which is biology. And those goos and glues and snots and slimes that the yeast helps to create form that structure in the bread that holds those, makes place for air and water to move through. The table next to ours has a little infiltration table, and I recommend that you check that out too in the back right. Our next guest is going to talk more about water. This is really the only bit that I'll talk about. Um, so on the top, we have a uh, rain simulation uh, table that is used. This is an outdoor table. This is a really common thing being done on farms all across the country. This is uh, this belongs to the NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service. <coughs> And you are looking at basically five different ways to grow dairy. You can grow dairy using annual corn tillage, or you can keep your cows out on pasture. And the three in between are just other ways of doing that. Um, and so when you do annual till, you've now killed billions and billions of microbes, and you've created flour out of what was once bread for as long as the earth has been. Um, but it could be destroyed very quickly. And if you look at the back line of jars, that's showing you how much water can infiltrate back into those aquifers that are drying up. And the line of jars in the front is runoff. So notice also the color of those waters. And if you look at the one that is grazed pasture, you'll see that nearly all of the water infiltrated through and is clear and the jar in the front did not collect anything, so there was no runoff. So you can imagine how a raindrop reacts from the right through to the left. On the bottom picture, this is only showing runoff, and it's obviously a cartoon. On a place that is completely vegetated, um, I mean, obviously it's gonna depend a little bit on the soil type that's underneath it, but for the main gist, when you have living plants growing, you get almost all infiltration and almost no runoff. When you have a city, you get all runoff and no infiltration. And there are some places in between that that we should be thinking more about when we plan our towns. The soil health principles as were defined by the Natural Resources Conservation Service are basically one through four, and then many of us have added the fifth one. These are very simple principles. And if we can embody these principles when we build, when we plan, when we create legislation, when we talk to each other, when we think about how ecosystems work, we might find that we'll make some big differences. So optimizing photosynthesis, another way of saying that, is living roots in the ground for as long as possible. When you have living roots in the ground, you have somewhere for water to go. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Maximizing diversity, everywhere, everyone, everything. So we're talking about microbes. We're talking about 50 species in a field as opposed to two in a field. We're talking about forests that are diverse of uh, species and not just a monocrop of forest. We're talking about mixed agriculture as opposed to 10,000 acres of one crop. Minimizing disturbance, so those are things like chemical fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, tilling machines, uh, anything that's digging into the ground and spitting it up, pollution. Uh, we want to minimize that. No bare soil is the principle, but I like to say minimize bare soil because actually the, the tiny little spaces in your lawn that might drive you crazy, um, but those little bare spaces in your lawn are actually very important for some insects uh, to be able to do their thing. So um, I think the word no is uh, a little too extreme. Minimizing bare soil. Because when we have bare soil, we've created flour. And when it rains, it's going to wash away. And when the wind blows, it's going to blow away. And when it gets really hot, no water is going to be able to infiltrate beyond the hard pan that forms on the top of that flour. Animal contact with soil is another one. 
Um, animals are a great way to be able to move nutrients uphill, right? So nutrients just come downhill and end up in our waterways. But one way that we can get them back uphill is through use of animals. And this happens in nature all the time. And so when I'm talking about animals, I'm talking about microbes and beetles and cows and chickens and pigs and elephants and buffalo and us. Can we be more in contact with the soil that we're essentially made of? So the first principle, um, harnessing photosynthesis, maximizing diversity, um, the real basics are that it's, it's, you know, photosynthesis. We learned this in fourth grade that the Earth's energy comes down. There is a budget for the amount of energy that the sun gives out. And about 50% of that energy goes down to land and ideally is then bringing the carbon cycle through the landscape. So photosynthesis takes carbon out of the air, turns it into sugars, Plants take that and send it through their root system. Through their root system, they're feeding billions and billions and billions of microorganisms sugars. So they're taking carbon, they're turning it into sugar. Those sugars are feeding organisms. Those organisms become long-term carbon. Those organisms are billions of bacteria, nematodes, protozoa, microarthropods, earthworms, voles, everything. In a teaspoon of healthy soil, you could have up to 75,000 species of bacteria, 600 million individual ones, 10,000 protozoa, a few hundred nematodes, a microarthropod, and possibly, if the soil hasn't been disturbed in a long time, a thousand miles or more of fungal hyphae in a teaspoon. When you don't have that, there's nothing to hold soil together. You have flour. So can we harvest more sunshine? Can we extend the length of green? If we fill a field full of corn, we're only going to get about 60, 70 days of photosynthesis happening in that field out of 365. If we have a field of conifers, we get 365, right? But it, what, everything in between, that is possibility. The possibility for extending the length of green season, even in Vermont, and perhaps especially now that winter's not gonna be as long. Um, the bottom right hand map is a standstill of three years of Landsat photographs of photosynthesis happen, basically. So it's called the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. You can find these maps on the Soil Carbon Coalition website. I highly recommend checking out that website. I'm involved with them. I am on their board as is Dee Purse House who are on the table here. That map is the Champlain Valley Water Basin. And so that is showing us the average day of three years. So those brown spots that you're looking at are either Burlington, Right? So it's going to be someplace that's impervious, or it's fields, dairy fields that are growing annual row crop. Perhaps there's some other things. Maybe there's a couple of landfills or something like that, too. If you span this map upward into Ottawa, you will see an amazing amount of brown around the northern part of the lake. So this picture, I just love it. Um, this, I just want to point out, that's 15 feet. And the circle is showing us what our standard lawn has in terms of root. Um, that's probably a single species. Even our conservation mixes around here uh, have rye, fescue, and clover. Those are going to give you a longer root depth than that, but it's probably not going to look anything like some of these perennials. These, this, this is a picture that's clearly hand-drawn, and this is showing some of the perennials that can grow in a midwestern prairie system, so it may not be completely transferable to Vermont, but the savvy gardeners of you may have already noticed that there's some Leatris and there are lupins and there are Echinacea in there. And did you know that Echinacea roots could be so long or that lupin roots could be so long? And if you're a water droplet and you're looking for somewhere to go, do those roots help you get down to the aquifer more quickly? 
along, around every single root is a little place called the rhizosphere. And in that rhizosphere is where those billions and billions and billions and billions of organisms and those miles and miles and miles of fungal hyphae are communicating with plants. That is the point of nutrient exchange. That is the point of life. When we don't have living roots in the ground, biology has nothing to live off of. So we want to expand the rhizosphere, and the way to do that is to deepen roots and to extend the length of time that living roots are in the ground. These are some of those organisms in the soil food web. And, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, um, but I, I am presenting at Billings this weekend just about this, if you're interested. Um, this is a web that is so necessary that we have every piece of it. Bacteria can hold nutrients, but they can't make them available to plants until a nematode or a protozoa comes along and eats and poops them out. It's just that simple. So we need a diversity of organisms in our soil. Their glues, snots, and slimes are the structure of the soil carbon sponge. We can turn that to that. This middle picture is um, Jack Laser's soil. So Jack Laser is one of my heroes. He and Ann run Butterworks Farm. I hope you've had their yogurt. If you haven't, please get it. They are amazing. Um, after two months of drought, so he lives up in that section that on the maps where it was shown that we have very high uh, drought this year. After two months of no rain, I dug down about 30 inches into his soil and there were well-formed soil aggregates all the way down. That's in a pasture that he hasn't tilled for 30 years and he feed, he's got grass-fed milk. You want grass-fed dairy products. You want grass-fed beef and animal products. Not only because they're better for your body, but because look at that grass after two months of no rain. And his cows had just grazed there 10 days before I dug that hole. So that was actually some amount of regrowth. We can do a lot to build the sponge, and we can make it look like that on the right-hand side. So that is, those are soil aggregates. Those aggregates are the places where the organisms are held. That's where the goos, glues, snots, and slimes come from. If you took that and you shook it, the aggregates would hang on. So can we shift our systems to provide multiple, multiple ecosystem services versus single services? On the left here, we have, these are just some simple farms that are thinking of more than just themselves. Bees, butterflies, birds, rodents, voles, deer, humans, water, all sorts of things are happening on the left side. On the right side, the only thing happen, happening is humans are getting fed. That's it. Nobody else in our ecosystem is getting fed. This is a good time to think about, I just want to point out when you drive around, do you see bugs on your windshield anymore? So can we learn to mimic natural ecosystem function? How can we better learn to work with nature? This picture to me is very inspiring. I don't think we should turn Vermont New Hampshire into that, but this is called agroforestry. This is using the contour of our lands and living roots and crops to produce multiple ecosystem services that will also infiltrate water and hold our landscapes in place. Can we learn from nature? So here's one of our best engineers on the planet, the beaver. And I think they can teach us a lot about restoring our water systems, restoring our wetlands. And yes, part of the answer might be no one gets to live by the river anymore. That could be part of the solution. Um, there is a woman here tonight, Jan Lambert, who uh, represents Voices of Water for Climate. She's sitting in the back right over there. And she is a beaver expert and can really talk a lot about water water cycles, the small water cycle, transpiration, if you're interested in that sort of thing, I highly recommend you connect with Jan. 
So in thinking about communities and what we can do, I would love to be able to think about what kind of outcomes and what kind of impacts are we dealing with when we don't take care of our water? We always have to be able to put a dollar sign on things. So if our impacts and loss and liabilities are drought, flooding, erosion, et cetera, in the purple box, how can we, how can we put value on these things in the green box? Because I think we probably can all agree that plant available water is valuable. Soil carbon, soil fertility, pollination, is that valuable? And if we're not providing those services, does that create a loss, liability, and impact for everyone? How can we shift that kind of thinking into our regional planners, our town planners, our public works departments, and on up the scale? And I want to leave you with some things that you can do. I feel like all of these things are accessible. I love Sherry's five gallon bucket in the shower. I'm a huge fan of five gallon buckets. I actually brought one with me tonight. It's under the table holding compost. Um, so when we shop, even if you don't have land, even if you live in an apartment building with no soil access at all, you can make a difference in soil health by looking at food labels to make sure that you're supporting grass-fed meat and dairy products, that you're supporting where, uh, where your food comes from, that you know where it comes from, that you might be able to talk to landowners about how they're preparing for flooding and drought and what kinds of things they're doing to their microbes. Do they even know they have microbes? Um, in your gardens, less disturbance, more living roots, no bare ground. Is that going to be easy? No, but it's doable. I do it. Um, lots of people are doing it. We have a lot to learn, and we can help each other do that. We can hire farmers, foresters, and land managers to deepen our watersheds. Our farmers are in really big trouble right now, especially our dairy farmers. And, and these farmers, even if they're not doing the exact right practices, we need them farming the land. We need open land to infiltrate water. Um, community planning, there's a lot we can do there. There's a lot we can do to learn and connect with each other. Stop by our little table and pick up some literature, and I look forward to chatting with you. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we're going to go ahead and we're going to switch yeah. gears to Lisa. And then uh, if you have questions <laughs> for Kat, we will have uh, time dedicated towards the end. So remember that and we can continue the conversation. So thank you so much, Kat. Okay, so Lisa, Le Lisa Lesigian is uh, from the Department of Environmental Services in New Hampshire and uh, a, 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 a leader in the Soak Up the Rain uh, program. So we'll get you queued up here. Thank you, Lisa. So, um, I'm Lisa Lucigen from New Hampshire DES. Is this uh, on or am I not? Is that better? Can you hear me now? Okay, is that better? So, I'm going to talk to you tonight about a program we have in the state of New Hampshire called Soak Up the Rain. Um, uh, Soak Up the Rain is, about, is a voluntary residential stormwater management program, which means it's about what can property owners do, homeowners and small property owners do, to soak up the rain on their property. Um, let me, is there a clicker as well? So Soak Up the Rain, the program really started from this homeowner's guide to stormwater management, which is, was, which is a publication we first put out in 2011, we've since updated it in 2016, but this uh, guide tells people how to soak up the rain. Uh, it has step-by-step -step instructions on 10 different practices that you can do at your home, and there's actually, I brought um, printouts of each of those, uh, and why it's important, a lot of that you heard about tonight, but it's all included in the guide, and. 
people were really interested in this guide and wanted to know how to implement it on a wider basis, such as in their watershed. And really, that is why, that is how our Soak of the Rain program began. We put that guide online and we built a whole program around it, which I can talk about at the end a little bit quickly about how we um, operate, but www.soaknh.org. There's tons of pictures on there. There's tons of resources and this and that. This guide in its entirety is on there and lots of other things. And we've heard a lot tonight about the water cycles and, and droughts and downpours. And um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this type of concept. And really, what, when, where we run into problems is over there on the right hand side where you have that snow melt runoff and the rain and the surface runoff and the infiltration into the groundwater, which gets interrupted when we start building our neighborhoods and our, our complexes and our, our roads and, our, and so forth. So instead of that, all that water running off, or rather soaking into the natural environment, it now much more runs off, which you all know and have heard about. And I tend to think about, or our program tends to think about the problems associated with that runoff in two major categories. One is pollutant delivery. So while that water is running off of those roads and those hard surfaces, it's picking up all kinds of nasty stuff and delivering that to our water bodies. And the other one is the too much runoff, which we've been talking about a lot tonight too, and not enough soaking in. And that can cause damage to both our natural systems when all that water rushes into rivers that weren't meant to handle so much water all of a sudden. It can scour them out and cause problems. But also our infrastructure, we've been hearing a little bit tonight. That's Elm Street in Manchester during the Mother's Day floods in 2006, where so much water was being, was getting into the stormwater system that it couldn't get out the end of the pipe quick enough and it backed up in those pipes and the, the manhole covers were popping up on the road. It's just a, a dramatic example of what happens when we don't let that water soak into the ground. And there are a lot of, um, many regulatory programs for a lot of our highly developed areas. There's regulatory programs on how to manage stormwater on our roads and our highways in many of our cities in New Hampshire, I'm not sure how Vermont works. Commercial developments, in our larger, even our larger residential developments, there's programs in place. But our um, program is really aimed at those single lot residential areas where they're not regulated in any way. There's no rules about how stormwater coming off your home or driveway should or needs to be treated. And that's where we saw an opportunity with our program is in all those backyards. Those are places where we can soak up the rain and reduce some of that water running off and carrying those pollutants to our water bodies. <coughs> so if we look a little more closely at each of our homes, this is a typical home, say, with a, a, a pet and a, we do some lawn care. And when it rains, those hard surfaces, such as our roofs, just shed water off of them. <coughs> so they're, they're adding to that too much runoff. Plus, they can be a source of pollutants, such as um, zinc, can come off of our asphalt roofs. Um, our driveways, when it rains and the water runs off them, salt, sand, oil, other types of things that are on our driveways can wash down into, um, can wash off. Even our lawns, if many of you saw our demonstrations back there, after about 10 years, our lawns can become so compacted that they act more like a driveway than a natural area. And if you fertilize a little too much, or maybe right, right before it rains, or you add pesticides, pet waste can contribute bacteria, and all that can wash off of your, our, your residential areas and cause water pollution that all heads down to a water body some way or another if it's not soaking in, either through a pipe system or if you live near a water body, sometimes it washes off your lawn right into a lake or a river. So why are we so worried about this runoff? Well, stormwater runoff causes, causes it or contributes to a large portion of the water pollution problems. And I don't need to say here, runoff just from our homes, I mean from the streets, the unregulated neighborhoods and, and developments. Um, and when I say water pollution problems, I mean water designated as 
water that doesn't meet its uses. It's too polluted for fish to, that should live there, or maybe doesn't just have doesn't have enough oxygen in the water for fish that should be there to live. Or beach closures, you see those. That's often the problem from stormwater runoff. So does anybody want to take a guess at how much of the water pollution problems are caused from stormwater runoff? What percentage? What, 50? It's more. It's 90%. 90% of the water pollution problems are caused from that stormwater runoff from those hard surfaces carrying too much water and pollution within that water. So what can we do? I said those backyards are opportunities. What can each of us do at our own homes? And this is really what our program is about. We have, um, as I said, uh, 10 types of practices or 10 practices that we promote through our program. Six of them are meant to directly infiltrate, which I call holes filled with stone, different shapes and sizes of holes filled with stone that you direct water into so it can infiltrate into the ground, such as trenches uh, under your drip line or along your driveway that will prevent that runoff from going down the road and into those catch basins. A good old fashioned dry well, dig a hole in the ground and fill it with stone and direct your roof runoff into it. And just picking up on the, the idea about how much plants add to our, our lives and our ecosystems, one of the things we did when we uh, redid this guide was add in ideas about how you can incorporate plants into these types of practices. You can plant on top of a dry well if you do it correctly, so it doesn't have to be a ugly square of stone in your yard. And there's directions in here for that. Porous pavers, which you know you're going to do have a patio in, on, in your backyard of brick or something else. You can put a layer of stone underneath that so the water goes between those bricks and down into the ground and soaks in. Infiltration steps are great for st sloped areas. They protect the slope from erosion while giving that rainwater somewhere to go. And the last infiltration practice is a rain garden, which I call a hole in the ground filled with plants. Um, so just to give a quick idea, this, this is the only one that I'll go into, but um, this is a rain garden we built with a partner um, in Greenland. This was the day after we planted it. You can see where it's dark there along the edges um, on the mulch. This thing filled all the way up. Uh, it was, a, I think, a two and a half inch storm the next day. And it filled up and it held a lot of water. Rain gardens are meant to soak, to soak in within a, a day. They're not meant to be wet ponds. They should drain out and the water infiltrates within a day. And the basic idea behind that, as I said, you dig a hole. So here's our original backyard level. Here's the top of the rain garden. So the plants are, are planted right in there. And it rains in that ponding area, which is the key feature, fills up with water, and then it slowly soaks into the ground. So those are the six practices that directly infiltrate water. And then there's four others that we promote and call them collect and direct, such as vegetated swales. You've all seen swales in ditches that just collect water and shoot it on down the way. And um, if you put plants in there, that will help to slow that water. Some of it will be um, taken up. It can also help uh, reduce sediment that's moving through. Uh, a vegetated buffer, which is so important between our developed areas and our water bodies, so that water from our, our lawns or our other developed areas aren't just washing down into the into the water bodies that um, they help reduce erosion and provide lots of other functions. Water bars are meant to push water off of slopes. It intercepts water as it's coming down the slope and pushes it off into a vegetated area. We built some of these with a, in a camp up in um, with a Green Mountain Conservation Group. Oh, I have a picture of that later. And the good old fashioned rain barrel, we were talking about just collecting water in barrels and using it. And these are great for, especially in times of drought, if you've collected your water. And the big knock on rain barrels is that they fill up really quickly, which is true. So there are, a lot, there are workarounds for that, though. This is another project we did with a partner where the homeowners split their gutter to go in two different directions, and we put a rain barrel at each end. You can also 
daisy chain them together so that you can collect twice as much water. So during those times of drought, you have water readily available for your, your uh, outdoor uses. So this is a neighborhood in uh, the Woosick Lake in Amherst. And we're not saying that rain gardens in the backyard and a couple of rain barrels here and there can, will really address this. It could help reduce it. If everybody in the neighborhood maybe is collecting their, their runoff, maybe we can help reduce it. But we can help with some severe um, problems associated with water runoff or in, in times of downpour. This is a camp up in, uh, on Lake Ossipee. Water was pouring down from a area up above this picture and up above and behind, rushing around this building and just gouging out this eroded channel. It was going right into Lake Ossipee. So we worked with the campers there and we built up behind the, the lodge building there. We put a set of those water bars in. We worked with the, the campers to, so they were learning along the way. We don't just go in and, and do these things. We work with partners to, to teach what can be done. So that pushed some of the water off into that vegetated area before it got down to the building. And then right next to the building, there were some steps there, but we retrofitted them by digging them out, digging the sand out of them, adding a few steps, and then filling them with that stone. And that really helped reduce that, those er that erosion and that sediment delivery to the lake. So I say downpour it into the ground. It's when those downpours come, find ways to get it into the ground. And that will help mitigate the effects of drought because that water will be in the ground where it needs to be so we can use it when we need it. We want to know that when we turn the spigot on, we can uh, use it for what we need and maybe for some fun too. Those rain barrels, can, we're teaching our little kids how to uh, conserve water and not need to turn the spigot on, but go dip into that rain barrel to water your plants. And as the point was made earlier, a lot of us rely on that water in the ground for our drinking water. So if we all find ways to help pour it into the ground, maybe it will be, maybe we can make a difference. So our program goal, really, we think of it in terms, um, we liken it to recycling. 30 years ago, there was not a lot of recycling. Now, as you can see, like in this building, it's very commonplace, and people are striving to do their best and to make the biggest difference they can. So we're hoping at some point, soaking up the rain and snow melt in our backyards will be as commonplace as recycling is now, and maybe we'll be able to make some of those same impacts. So just really quickly, how our program operates is we have a very robust website. For those of you that have ever accessed a DES web page, they are not very pretty and sometimes not very easy to navigate, but this is its own unique website. It doesn't look anything like a, a government web page. There's lots of stories, there's lots of photos, there's lots of resources, and we have a Facebook page too. We do tons of presentations like this one to all kinds of groups all over the state of New Hampshire. We do lots of public outreach events. We provide technical assistance. This is in the background there. We work with Phillips Exeter Academy in 2016 on their Climate Action Day to teach students how to install rain gardens. We install this rain garden on site and also a, a driveway infiltration trench is a great project. We sometimes have, um, in, our, in New Hampshire, we, well, Vermont, we have it too, I think the, the 319 grant program, and we've been able to work with some partners to get some good projects in. We build partnerships around the state. We work with watershed associations and lake associations to help them establish their own local Soak Up the Rain program so they can get this message out to their membership. And so finally, um, I think that our program ties in nicely with this idea of managing for extremes, the infiltrating water, storing it in the ground, educating people, uh, slowing it down, educating people, engaging people, and, and invoking a sense of personal responsibility. Uh, fits in well with managing with the added benefit of filtering pollutants along the way soak that water into the ground. Um, 
But really, we're still here. We're still trying to uh, reach out to people, educate people. So I want to thank all of you for coming here tonight, because this is how these things are going to get done, by you know, people coming out and learning and taking this message home and doing, what, doing their part. And really, a lot of the, several of the projects that we've done, then we've had neighborhood um, events where the host where we put, helped put a rain garden in will have a neighborhood party and they come over and the, the homeowner will teach them about what they did and why. And that's really how we're hoping to spread the word. So that's it for me. Um, that's the, our website and um, my contact information. And for those of you in Vermont, of course, please come to our website and, um, and, and engage too. EPA also has a Soak Up the Rain program where they uh, can connect to a lot of these same types of resources. They have um, links to these same types of things that homeowners can do and um, things that communities are doing. So uh, that's it for me. Right. Okay, so now we've got some time just to kind of open up without any specific agenda or speaker, but to hear from all of you in terms of what questions do you have, either for Lisa, for Kat, or any of the other speakers, or what ideas do you have, what actions do you have. We'd also love to hear if you have a project in mind where you need some volunteer support, let us know. We want to learn about those. We can hear about it tonight. We can also communicate that through our uh, distribution email list. So I'm going to um, turn it over to Sherry to help facilitate this discussion. I'm going to run the mic around. So if you do have a comment to make, uh, let me know, and I'll try to get you mics. Sure. Thank you, Alex. Before we start into this part, I know Kat and Lisa had some specific things that they wanted to remind you that you could do. And while they're doing that, I'm going to tell you two things. Number one, Barbara's going to be handing out some green evaluation forms. Barbara and maybe Lisa will help her. And then I'd like you to fill out those evaluation forms because they help us pre prepare our next forum. So we'd like to know what you learned here, how you liked it, and what you'd like to learn in the future. And then I have these two boxes in my hand. And in these boxes, you are going to put your evaluation forms as well as your name tags. So if you feel like you don't want to take part in this conversation and you want to get out of here, that's fine. You can go, but please put your stuff up there and please fill out the evaluation form. So thank you. And now let's get to your specific actions that you wanted to bring out. Yeah. Specific actions. Did you um, have any? Well, my specific actions were on my last slide okay. and they're on a handout, but basically it's build the soil carbon sponge. You can start doing that in your backyard. You can do it in communities. You can get involved with your town planning boards. Um, I just saw something happen in Hartford, and I'm sorry if there's anyone from the Hartford Planning Commission here, um, but I'm really embarrassed that Hartford just put in a three-acre parking lot on top of a hill that leads directly into a portion of town that gets flooded every single time it rains. Anything specific, Lisa? Oh, well, as I mentioned, the, um, the, I printed out step-by-step -step instructions for each of the 10 BMPs or practices that we promote. There's also a handout that you could bring back to your, if you have some place that you could hand them out. Um, it's just a, a single page there that shows each of the practices. There's a flyer over there you could take home. Um, awesome. Thank you. Okay, now does anybody have any questions? Sir, you had a question right off. Yes. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. So I recently went to a workshop a couple of weeks ago and I learned about something that I had no idea of before this. And how many of you have heard about the use of wood in that large trees in streams? Mm -hmm. We talked about uh, water management and erosion control, habitat improvement. How many people have heard about this? Like so, beavers? No, not So. Um, I went to this workshop that was put on by the New Hampshire Cooperative Extension with organizations of Fish and New Hampshire Fish and Game, uh, DES Wetlands Bureau, uh, Trouts Unlimited, um, and an organization called the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And in this workshop, we learned about putting large trees in streams, cutting down 50 and 75 foot trees and putting them in streams 
to decrease water flow, to change habitat, um, to make a, the treetops become a sane for sediment that comes down the stream. The leaves get trapped in the branches, the bugs eat, the, the, the leaves decay, and the bacteria eat the leaves, the bugs eat the bacteria, and the fish eat the bugs, and other animals, including trout fishermen, uh, eat the fish. Um, and it's just an amazing um, process that I just learned about a couple of weeks ago. I guess there's a project in Orford. Um, what was the name of the people? Schwazer. Schwazer. Um, project in Orford where they did this stream mitigation. And it, it, it was just very interesting to me. You know, we talk about the circle of life and the slowing of the streams. Uh, just many uh, amazing things from this project. And I just wondered if anybody's ever done that or um, any contributions you can make. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm sure technical assistance is available if you're going to do something like that. So don't just drop trees and put them in your stream without getting a little assistance. <laughs> oh, no, that's, there was a, there was a huge something? process. It's all scienced out. They have the science behind it. And they have a very intricate process of applying for it, the applications, and the planning for it. Uh, it's very, very structured. Yeah. It's fascinating, and it also mimics the beaver. I think we might have learned that from someone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you all for your presentation tonight. Um, you all seem to be from government or educational institutions, and you said that there is technical assistance if you want to use some of these things. Should we be contacting you as consultants to our private, you know, to our personal households, or or are there private uh, businesses that, that do this sort of work? If you want to sure, do, we we really get into yeah, that. Yeah, is not for government. She would I'm like, a private she would consultant. Like you to know that. Okay. Yeah, and um, so you could contact private consultants. You could contact our office, and we have technical assistance programs like Reese's program where we could help private homeowners figure out what's the best things to do? Absolutely. Thank you. <coughs> also, I'm just going to put a plug in again for Kevin and for Megan. Your, yeah. uh, your regional no planning commissions have technical assistance available to you and your municipalities. And Lisa has a clear plan. Yeah, I, I would love to say call me up and I'll come out to your house. I would love to be able to do that, but unfortunately it's just mostly me and one other person that works on this part-time. So most of our outreach and our technical assistance is done through um, watershed association groups or, or um, lake association groups where I come out, I do a presentation similar to this. We have sign-ups for people that are interested and I'll go out and do site walks with them. We'll go out for a whole day and go to multiple places and make re recommendations. But, um, and there are other private, there's, there's some company called Rain Garden Girl or something like that. There, there are some private companies around the state that are doing that. But I, I would love to come out teaching every one of you, but I, I can't do that. Better if it's a group. Yep. Question. Yes. Thanks. Uh, thanks to all of you and, and to our hosts. Um, my question was uh, kind of building off the wooden debris in the streams question and and uh, the fact that we have two states here tonight. Um, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this idea, or this, and it's not gotten any traction in Vermont, either the legislature or the uh, agencies that I've spoken with, but I'm curious to know if New Hampshire would fund the building of soil on, say, larger properties, maybe not just half acre homesteads. But let me paint a quick picture for you. Everyone has seen hay fields, and we know what all the wind rows of hay look like, and you've got your rows before you bale it up, and, and you could take that picture of a hay field with its wind rows, and if you just replace the hay with woody debris, everyone has openings and edges and wood lines, and we always want to push the wood lines back and trim them every year. But then we make massive burn piles and we burn off all the vegetation because we don't like the way it looks. So I'm curious to know if I've asked Vermont to stop or to figure out some way to reduce our 50,000 annual burn piles that we do every year. I'm wondering if New Hampshire would think about as part of the, I think your brochure is great, so New Hampshire, 
could, would you ever consider funding for people with enough property? The idea of wind growing every year, this year's cuttings, next year's cuttings, next year's brush, and so on, and allowing that vegetation to hold water on the land, become soil over time, at which point you even sell the soil if it, if it was solarized and didn't have invasive seed and so forth. And it, it would kind of be a, a, a self, uh, what that's called, self perpetuating notion. Any thoughts on that? Thanks. Would New Hampshire be farmed if they were to have the <laughs> no, um, just kidding. Um, so chances are it wouldn't get a line item to fund this type of behavior. And, and given, I've been in New Hampshire government for way too long. Um, and what my experience is, is we can be more effective at educating people. Because if I fund you, just say I could fund you, some people would see that as a mandate or something that is government in intervention too much, especially in residential homeowners. So chances are I would approach it a different way and I would encourage more education about this. I, I honestly have been thinking a lot about this on my property and trying to keep the carbon in place instead of putting it in a burn pile, exactly what you're talking about. So I think education is our first place to start and once people start doing it, perhaps there would be an opportunity for funding in the future. But I don't think that that would be the first way to do this because there might not be a full understanding of why we're doing this and so getting the why out there like through Kat's presentation and this conversation we're having. So I think the best approach is to really talk this up, share it with your friends, help people understand that keep carbon as carbon, enrich the soil. But very good question. Quick comment. Yeah, sure. Um, so that reminds me of Google Culture. Uh, raise your hand if you have not heard of Google Culture. Okay, so Google Culture is H-U-G-E-L-K-U-L-T-U-R-E, I think. And it is, um, uh, very simply put, it's the practice of using down wood and building berms or swales with it. Some people dig them in, you can do it on contour. They're great fungal communities. We need to restore the fungal communities in our soils that we've destroyed. They can manage water very well. You can grow food on top of them. If you'd like to see some examples, there is one at the community garden behind the CCBA in Lebanon. Pat McGovern runs that garden. There's another one at the Center for Transformational Practice in White River Junction. Very easy. Not going to get funded as far as I know, but um, I highly recommend it. Way better than Bernie. Very good. And I'll, and I'll say from the Vermont government side, we're probably not going to fund it either. Um, however, going back to the previous question about getting technical assistance, whether you're in Vermont or New Hampshire, you have a Natural Resource Conservation District office somewhere, either in your county or in your region. And those folks, their job is to work with private landowners um, on natural resource conservation. So they are a great resource for you for a first contact because they'll know who to send you to. Great, thank you for saying that. And if you're in on the Vermont side, um, you have folks like me who are your local watershed coordinators who work on all sorts of water quality issues, planning, assisting municipalities. And in Vermont, we do have funding to assist with stormwater projects and all those kind of things. So you can contact your local basin planner as well. So there's different options for, you for getting that technical assistance. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Way in the back. Since everybody's been talking about wood, I thought I'd go back to the beavers. Kat, uh, Jane Langer, and Kat said I was back here. Know a little bit about beavers. I just wanted to let everybody know tonight that there's been a report just put out in the last month or so out of Andover, New Hampshire. Um, beavers typically get a bad name uh, because sometimes they cause problems and actually cause floods. They were saying you know they can help prevent them, but but they do cause problems and it costs towns a lot of money. Well, 
the study was a long time coming because it's, it's kind of hard to keep track of all the data, but in Andover, New Hampshire, they had a long-standing problem with flooding caused by beavers, and they found by s switching from killing them and therefore draining the wetlands, losing those wetland functions, the beavers always came back. The town was spending something like over a 30-year period, about $500,000 to get beavers trapped, to repair the roads, to keep uh, elaborate methods of, of dislodging debris from the culverts that would happen constantly. So they found by hiring an expert to put in non-kill flow devices, now their 30-year cost is 48000 versus a 30-year cost of traditional methods, 540000 So um, if you live in a town that has problem with beavers, um, you might want to pick up, I have 50 copies of this report if you'd like to see it. And um, I do a lot of other stuff too about all that. Thank you more time. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, let's wrap it up. So on behalf of the Upper Valley Adaptation Work Group and Vital Communities, we'd like to thank you all for taking time to be with us tonight, and we wish you a safe drive home. Please hand in your evaluations and your name tags, and now you will be added to our mailing list, so you will get notices about our upcoming forums. We usually have one in the fall and one in the spring, and we'd like to get some community work days engagement as well, so just pay attention to an email from us, and you'll be able to participate more with our groups. Thank you so much. Alex?